Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this podcast on sea urchin development. Let's begin by reviewing some things that we've already talked about that relate to sea urchin development. You'll remember that sea urchins are deuterostomes, and they undergo radial holoblastic cleavage. So uh, this is figure 7-3 from your text. Actually, I generated a lot of these pictures in my earlier days as a sea urchin biologist. What this shows is on the upper left that uh, a fertilized sea urchin egg develops a fertilization envelope and then uh, in the middle panel on the top uh, it's undergone first cleavage to form two cells then four cells on the upper right and after two more cleavages you can see that the embryo has undergone some asymmetric cleavages the, cleav the cleavages are radial but you get cells of very different sizes in particular at the extreme vegetal pole of the embryo we get micromeres. At the next division those micromeres divide again to get very small micromeres at the extreme vegetal pole and you can see that there's a fluid filled cavity, the blastocele that's formed. And eventually by the time that uh, many more cleavages have occurred we get a hollow ball, the blastula, which you can see on the lower right. Now although it's not obvious there are different cells in the blastula that adopt very different fates and contribute to various germ layers. Now, uh, just to remind you, if we flip the embryo up on its end, on its vegetal end, at the 16 cell stage, here are the micromeres on the left. You can see these very small cells, there's four of them, and lying immediately on top of them are much larger cells, the macromeres. If we flip the embryo 90 degrees so that we're looking at it from its side, that's on the right, you can see the moderately sized mesomeres on top. So it turns out that a very smart guy named Sven Herstadius did fate mapping to look at which cells in the early sea urchin embryo contribute to which germ layers. And so this is figure 7-2, and this shows uh, the kind of embryological fate mapping colors that you're used to by now in this class. And what you can see is that the first two cleavages from a one-celled zygote to a two-cell embryo to a four-cell embryo along the top divide the embryo along its entire animal vegetal axis. At the next cleavage, however, the uh, plane of cleavage is orthogonal to the animal vegetal axis, and this creates two tiers or two uh, rows of cells, an animal half on the top and a vegetal half on the bottom. Now you can see that the animal half is colored blue. That means all of those cells contribute only to ectoderm normally, and the bottom tier of cells contribute to the endoderm and the mesoderm. At the next division, we get an asymmetric division, as we've already said, to form micromeres at the extreme bottom. They're colored bright red uh, in this diagram. Then the macromeres, some of their descendants will contribute to endoderm, a little bit of ectoderm, and a lot of mesoderm. And then the mesomeres divide um, along a different axial plane to generate eight cells along the top. They are all fated to form ectoderm. If we follow things out for two more divisions, you can see that by the 64 cell stage on the lower right, uh, the embryo is divided into a number of layers. So at the very top, our cells derived from a layer called the animal one layer. The darker blue cells also make ectoderm. They're derived from the animal two layer. And then you can see that there are two tiers of cells called veg one and veg two beneath them. The veg one tier um, those cells are colored yellow and a little bit of blue. That's because their descendants generate some ectoderm and a, a lot of the endoderm. And the same is true for the VEG2 cells. They generate a lot of endoderm. They also generate some mesoderm, and uh, we'll see that those come from cells called secondary mesenchyme cells at the tip of the forming gut rudiment, or archenteron. The micromeres at the very bottom form skeletal cells, a specialized kind of mesoderm. So uh, Herstadius developed a really refined fate map of the sea urchin embryo, and, and here is that fate map, modified from figure 7-4 from your text. This shows that not only are cells different along the animal vegetal axis, but this introduces a new axis we haven't discussed before. That's the ventral to dorsal, or mouth side, oral side to aboral, non-mouth side, of the embryo. So. Um, uh, we'll talk about these two different axes as we move along at the molecular level. You can see again that the AN1 and AN2 tiers of cells, at least the cells derived from these, 
form ectoderm. The VEG1 tier forms some ectoderm and some endoderm. VEG2 forms some endoderm and mesoderm. And then the larger micromeres uh, at this stage, they're going to form a specialized kind of mesoderm called skeletogenic mesoderm. This forms special skeletal rods that give the later larva its shape. So the animal cells give rise to both oral or ventral ectoderm and aboral or dorsal ectoderm. The VEG1 cells form the base of the archenteron and some ectoderm. The VEG2 cells form endoderm and some additional mesoderm called secondary mesenchyme cells, which we'll talk about in the second part of our podcast on gastrulation. And then these large micromeres give rise to the skeletogenic or what's called primary mesenchyme. Let's look at some actual embryos at different stages of development and use this blue, uh, pink, and yellow coloring scheme to see where these cells are, are coming from. So here's a 16 cell embryo, and uh, you can see that the mesomeres are in blue on top, the macromeres slightly larger in yellow, and then the micromeres at the bottom in pink. A little later, the very early blastula stage, you can see now that the um, uh, Mesomeres have formed the ectoderm in blue. The cells that will form the endoderm, the primitive gut, are colored yellow, and they surround a little group of cells at the vegetal pole that are colored pink that are going to form mesoderm. Those cells are the uh, skeletogenic uh, mesenchyme cells. Eventually the embryo hatches out of its fertilization envelope, and it does that by secreting some enzymes that allow it to, to break free. And then we have a blastula stage embryo. And at this point, the skeletogenic mesoderm moves to the interior. You can see the pink cells have moved to the inside. They do that by ingression, leaving the yellow colored cells, which eventually will form the gut rudiment in yellow at the vegetal pole. You can see a little dimple there. That's the blastopore. That's, remember, the opening around which cells move as cells are internalized during gastrulation movements. That's a general term that, that we've already come across earlier in the semester. And you can see that the blue is covering most of the embryo. That's ectoderm. The interior fluid-filled cavity, remember, is called the blastocele. Now, as gastrulation is largely complete, the embryo becomes radically transformed. So that yellow material has extended and moved into the interior. That forms the primitive gut rudiment, or archenteron. There are some mesoderm cells that bud off of the tip of the archenteron. These are a second set of mesenchyme cells, so they're called secondary mesenchyme. Meanwhile, the primary mesenchyme cells, which were the first cells to move into the interior, they've migrated about inside the, the embryo, and they've begun secreting a calcium carbonate-based skeleton that forms needle-like projections called spicules. And you can see the blastopore at the bottom of the embryo. This blastopore is the um, first opening to form in the gut tube, because th these embryos are deuterostomes, that means that's going to form the anus, and a second opening ultimately will form the mouth at the tip of the archenteron a little bit later. All right, so eventually these, these uh, skeletal rods, the spicules, become much longer and the embryo becomes much more spaceship-like, and at that point it's called a pluteus. So here's a pluteus larva, and uh, this is figure 712 from your text. Now, what I'll, I'll do using the magic of Photoshop is to colorize the various germ layers here so you can get a sense for what's going on. You can see then that the skeletal rods are in pink and they become highly elaborated in a very specific structure. More on that later in the second part of the podcast. The gut rudiment, the archeneron, has divided into three parts, an anus. At the opposite end, now we finally have a mouth, the second opening and there's an esophagus and a stomach in the middle. And then uh, most of the spaceship structure of the pluteus is formed by the ectoderm in blue. Okay, so those are the differentiated tissues. And now what we want to do is to discuss where do these tissues come from? And we want to start by looking at potential asymmetries in the unfertilized or newly fertilized egg, and then trace that process through developmental time until we get the various germ layers that we've been discussing. So let's do that. Now, I told you that this guy, Sven Herstadius, was a very smart embryologist, and he did the following experiment. To do this experiment, he capitalized on the fact 
that a Mediterranean species of sea urchin, Paracentrotus lividus, has an asymmetrically localized pigment band, which is shown in yellow in this diagram. It's towards the vegetal pole of the unfertilized egg. Herstadius used this marker and he used a needle to cut the unfertilized egg in half. Now in these experiments, Herstadius would fertilize the fragment that got the nucleus, and the nucleus tends to get pushed to one half or the other. So you could fertilize either half, if it got a nucleus and it got fertilized, either half in this kind of an experiment will reliably form a nice looking pluteus larva. So the conclusion from this is that the fragments that get a nucleus and have the entire animal vegetal axis in terms of the cytoplasm along that axis, they can develop normally. So that means that if you get material from the entire animal vegetal axis and a nucleus, that's sufficient to direct normal development. But then Herstadius did another experiment shown on the next slide. Herstadius made the cut now in the perpendicular direction, perpendicular to the animal vegetal, vegetal axis. In this case, then, he would take the animal half, or the vegetal half, and if it got the nucleus, then he would fertilize that. If an animal half with a nucleus is fertilized, Herstadius now didn't get a normal larva. Instead, he got a blastula with very long cilia called a permanent blastula, or the German word for that is dauer, so it was called a dauer blastula. Conversely, the vegetal half fragments that received the nucleus, if they were fertilized, what Herstadius found was that he got an embryo that was lacking a lot of the ectoderm, but had endoderm and mesoderm. So what could Herstadius conclude from this experiment? Well, what he can conclude was that the vegetal half contains determinants that are needed for mesoderm and endoderm formation. You also need the animal half to get a normal embryo. Neither one of these fragments is normal, but you can see that the vegetal half is the only kind of fragment that makes endoderm and mesoderm. This suggested to Herstadius then that there are asymmetries in the fertilized egg that are carried through into later development. Now remember that we talked about this experiment involving a guy who gave up biology to become a philosopher. His name was Hans Driesch and he did the following experiment. Remember he could take a four cell embryo and separate each of those cells and what he found was that you would get a perfectly proportioned larva out of each of those four cells. That showed that each of the four cells was totipotent. And Herstadius showed, in fact, that there's really no differences between any of these four cells by doing more sophisticated cell marking experiments. But Herstadius went on and did the following really interesting experiment. At the next division, remember we get an eight cell embryo that has an animal half and a vegetal half. Well, Herstadius knew which half was which because he was working with these sea urchins that had this pigment band that told him which side was vegetal and which side was animal. He could then isolate the top half, the animal half, or the bottom half, the vegetal half, and see what do they make. And what Herstadius found was that the animal half forms one of these permanent blastulae, these dower blastulae, whereas the vegetal half forms a fragment that has a lot of endoderm and mesoderm and looks very much like the pieces of, of eggs that Herstadius then fertilized if they were the vegetal half of the egg. So this was really interesting and led Herstadius to the following conclusion. The vegetal tier of cells at the eight cell stage have already been specified to form mesoderm and endoderm. And Herstadius postulated that that was because they inherited substances from the fertilized egg that were found only in the vegetal region. In the absence of these cells, Herstadius could further conclude that you get ectoderm from the rest of the embryo, the animal half, but it was incomplete ectoderm. So you need both the animal half and the vegetal half, but already by the eight cell stage, the vegetal half has been specified to form endoderm and mesoderm. Now this is not the entire story. Remember we need both parts to make a fully proportioned normal embryo. So it's possible that the endoderm and, and 
uh, mesoderm that are formed from the vegetal portions of an embryo do additional things to allow for full differentiation of a sea urchin zygote, and that's actually correct. And Herstadius did a really nice experiment to show this, and that's shown on the next slide. This is figure 7-6 from your textbook. Herstadius took a 16-cell sea urchin embryo, and he took the micromeres from a second 16-cell stage embryo, and he transplanted them to the animal pole. So the resulting embryo has its normal micromeres on the bottom and an extra set of micromeres on the top. If those micromeres are capable of signaling, then we might expect changes in differentiation of the surrounding cells colored blue in this diagram that would normally become ectoderm. And that's exactly what Herstadius found, because he found that if you took one of these embryos and allowed them to develop, now you get the normal archenteron, the normal gut tube at the bottom colored yellow. That forms endoderm. And the micromeres derive from that region, the normal micromeres move into the interior and form mesoderm as they should. But now you get a second gut rudiment on the top colored green in this diagram. And the transplanted micromeres, they move into the interior to form an additional set of mesodermal cells that are going to form additional skeletal rods. So that if we follow these embryos out a little bit later, the top is what we had on the previous slide, but now as you watch these embryos later, they form an extra set of skeletal rods. So the conclusion from this sort of an experiment is that micromeres can induce endoderm in cells that don't normally make it. So they're acting sort of like a Spamon organizer equivalent, but in a sea urchin. Moreover, once an archenteron forms, additional signaling occurs to adjacent ectoderm, and this supports the formation of an additional set of skeletal rods by mesodermal cells that somehow respond to information in the ectoderm, the blue colored cells in this diagram. All right, so this is all really nice embryology, but can we put some molecular details into the mix here to help explain what's going on? Well, we can to some extent. This is figure 7-7 seven, seven from your text. What it shows is that a molecule you've heard about in the connection with wind, uh, in, in, uh, uh, connected with wind signaling is localized at the vegetal pole, and that's the protein disheveled. Disheveled is at the vegetal pole in the fertilized egg, shown on the left here in this diagram, figure 7-7. Seven, seven. And at the 16-cell stage on the right, you can see that the micromeres, two of which you can see in this figure have high levels of disheveled at their vegetal surfaces. So disheveled is at the cortex in micromeres. That's really interesting. So it's possible that disheveled could be involved in helping micromeres to differentiate and then micromeres could send signals to surrounding cells to help them differentiate. Now you remember that disheveled is involved in uh, wind signaling and where we have high levels of activated disheveled, we get accumulation of beta-catenin, and this can go into the nucleus and alter gene expression. So the model here is that disheveled may lead to the activation of nuclear beta-catenin. The idea here is that you may not even need a wind signal because you've already put a bunch of disheveled, which normally accumulates in response to wind signals, at the vegetal pole of the embryo. And uh, so, uh, Although there's some evidence that a wind might be involved, just putting disheveled here may be enough. So here's a reminder of what you've already learned about. In fact, you had to learn for, for a quiz early in the semester. Disheveled, when it's activated, inhibits the destruction complex, and this allows beta-catenin to accumulate. So disheveled inhibits this complex. Beta-catenin accumulates. That's the red blob in this diagram. And together with the TCF left protein shown in uh, olive green, can go into the nucleus and activate the expression of genes that normally respond to wind signals. So if disheveled were localized, it could activate genes that are responsive to beta-catenin. And the first prediction of this model is that we might expect beta-catenin to be in the nucleus in cells that had high levels of disheveled due to this vegetal localization. So let's look at that. 
This is another portion of figure 7-7 seven, seven from your text and shows that in fact that's exactly what happens. So the large micromeres, those are the ones that form skeletogenic mesenchyme, they have very high levels of nuclear beta-catenin shown in dark orange in the interpretive diagram on the right. So the conclusion here then is that nuclear beta-catenin is at highest levels in the micromeres. It's at intermediate levels in cells that are going to become a lot of the endoderm. Those are the VEG2 cells. You can see them uh, with their nuclei in kind of light orange in this diagram. So beta-catenin might be part of the story of vegetal differentiation in the sea urchin embryo. The next slide shows a movie uh, following beta-catenin GFP um, in uh, early sea urchin embryos. This is a movie from Chuck Edmondson's lab. So let's run this movie forward and I think you'll get the idea. So as you run this movie forward, you can see there are very small cells at the bottom of the embryo and eventually very high levels of beta-catenin are only retained at the vegetal pole. And this is in accord with the static diagrams that we saw on the previous slide. So beta-catenin is there at high levels. So you should now ask yourself, are there experiments we could do to test whether beta-catenin is sufficient or necessary to force cells to adopt more vegetal fates? The readout there would be that we would get excess endoderm and mesoderm if we force cells to become, uh, to change their fate in this way. The converse would be that if we were to uh, remove uh, vegetal fates from the embryo, we would get loss of endoderm and mesoderm and we get excess ectoderm. So it turns out that we can do these experiments and uh, now we might choose to do them in a slightly different way, but I'll tell you how they were actually done uh, originally. And those experiments are shown in figure 7-7. Seven, seven. So uh, we can do simple overexpression experiments to force cells uh, to have too much beta-catenin. Some of that then will go into the nucleus and look at the effects. And that's what's shown here. So if we do mRNA overexpression, what we see is that we get excess nuclear beta-catenin in many more cells than would normally have high levels of beta-catenin. And I think what you can see um, is that uh, if we stain for beta-catenin using an antibody, it's easy to see there's lots more beta-catenin in nuclei over much more of the embryo. So we can do overexpression to get excess beta-catenin. What about the converse experiment? Well, to do the converse experiment, the way this was originally done was to force embryos to express a fragment of a cadherin. Now you remember that beta-catenin in its life as a cell adhesion accessory protein can bind cadherin. So if we force embryos to make this fragment of cadherin, it acts like a beta-catenin sponge and forces beta-catenin away from the nucleus to the cell surface. The results of that experiment are shown in the next part of figure 7-7 seven, seven on the next slide. So here you can see that almost all the beta-catenin is at cell-cell boundaries and now we don't see the round blobs which are our, our nuclei. So we've driven beta-catenin away from the nucleus to the cell surface. So this is a way that we can have too little beta-catenin in nuclei and ask, does that affect vegetal fates? All right, so we've got overexpression, we've got loss of nuclear beta-catenin, let's see what happens to the embryos. <clears throat> so this overexpression of cadherin again drives this loss of beta-catenin. Okay, so let's see what the uh, terminal phenotypes are. What do these embryos eventually look like that we've monkeyed with in this way? All right, so in the upper left here is a normal pluteus. You've seen that before. An embryo that in which there's overexpression of beta-catenin, so we get excess nuclear beta-catenin, produces a vast excess of mesoderm, and we get this giant piece of endoderm, a giant gut on the outside of the embryo. So this is sort of an Audi embryo. And this looks like a vegetalized kind of embryo, sort of like the fragments, vegetal fragments, that Herstadius had uh, identified. Conversely, the embryo at the bottom has much less nuclear beta-catenin than normal. And here you can see that almost all of the embryos converted to ectoderm. So we just get a, a permanent blastula. It looks a lot like the dour blastulae that Herstadius had identified. 
So the conclusion here is that beta-catenin is required for correct differentiation of vegetal tissues. All right, so beta-catenin is clearly important for animal versus vegetal differentiation. But you remember that we talked about a, another axis that we have to come to terms with. That's the ventral to dorsal or oral to aboral axis. And there's a, a different signaling pathway that's involved in specifying that axis. And that involves a protein called nodal. And you remember, I, I had you memorize some signaling pathways that involve nodal and other TGF beta family proteins. So nodal is a member of the TGF beta family. And you remember that these are serine threonine kinases, or the receptors are, when they bind the ligand, a growth factor, they become phosphorylated on serines and threonines. And this leads to the activation of cytoplasmic proteins called SMADs. For TGF beta or, or activin or related proteins, there's a particular set of SMADs involved. For other members of this large family called BMPs, there's a different set of SMADs. But in either case, phosphorylation of uh, some of these SMADs leads them to bind another SMAD called SMAD4, and that complex of proteins moves into the nucleus, binds DNA, and acts as a regu regulatory transcription factor to alter gene expression. Now it turns out that nodal is an important member of this family. Nodal is very important in um, a number of deuterostome embryos including vertebrates. And it turns out it's often involved, as we'll see later in the semester, in establishing left-right asymmetries. So nodal is an interesting molecule that might be involved in establishing your left from your right, or maybe your mouth from your non-mouth if you're a sea urchin embryo. And it turns out that nodal is involved in establishing this ventral to dorsal or oral to aboral axis. And you can guess that by looking at its expression pattern, which is shown on the next slide. So the next slide is figure 710 from your textbook and shows a, what's called a mesenchyme blastula in which mesenchyme cells are ingressing into the interior on the left. And you can see that there's a, a, a part, a, a nice region that's stained dark purple by in situ hybridization. This is picking up nodal mRNA in a particular part of the embryo. And that part of the embryo, it turns out, is the part that's going to form the mouth. It's the oral ectoderm. Now later, in a late gastral stage embryo, you can see that nodal is also expressed at high levels on what turns out to be the right side of the embryo. So nodal is initially expressed in the oral ectoderm at high levels, and later it's expressed on the right side of the embryo. It's the perfect kind of molecule to be involved in establishing important asymmetries along axes that are orthogonal or perpendicular to the animal vegetal axis. So we can do similar experiments to the ones we've already looked at with regard to beta-catenin to determine whether nodal is playing an important role in specifying the oral to aboral or ventral to dorsal axis and as well as establishing fundamental asymmetries that lead to right-left patterning and those kinds of, of differentiation events in the later sea urchin embryo. <clears throat> so the, the, we can look at a simple experiment to knock down nodal, and, and you'll remember that uh, sea urchins are one of the organisms in which we can use morpholino antisense oligonucleotides to do that. So let's look at what happens when we use nodal morpholinos to perturb nodal protein expression. So what we're looking at here on the left is a normal embryo flipped up, so you're looking at its bottom. There's a circular region in the middle, that's the archenteron, which is invaginating or moving into the interior away from you, so you're looking at the anus of the embryo. And the white arrows are pointing out two clusters of skeletogenic mesoderms. So these are mesenchyme cells that are clustering together, and they're going to form the skeletal rods that are so characteristic of the later larva you can see that there are two such clusters forming very nicely. The embryo on the right <coughs> has been injected with a morpholino, and you can see that there are no clusters. In fact, these mesoderm cells form all the way around. It's as if the embryo is completely confused about its oral and its aboral or its right from its left. So the conclusion here 
is the correct nodal expression is needed for these axes. It's needed for oral aboral or ventral to dorsal patterning of the ectoderm. And it turns out, although this doesn't really show at this particular slide, it's, it's required for right-left patterning as well. Now the details are beyond the scope of what we want to talk about, but I hope this gives you a sense that growth factors are important in specifying the oral aboral or, or ventral to dorsal axis. We also saw, you'll recall, that beta-catenin is really important for establishing animal versus vegetal fates in the embryo. We mentioned these signaling pathways because, as it turns out, they're going to be reused in interesting ways when we get to chordate development a little later. But that's all we want to say about axis specification in sea urchins and some of the molecular details involved. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast. The second installment of this podcast will look at what happens during sea urchin gastrulation. Thanks a lot.